Okay. Hit it. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Silent Mystics, Finding Your Voice. Each week, we're going to feature people from all over the world who have experienced the mystical, the magical, and in some cases, the seemingly unexplainable. I'm Gerald Ann, and along with my co-host Diana, we hope that you'll join us each and every week on this wonderful new adventure as we delve into the unknown and the unseen. And we also would like for you to share this out at this time, if you would, so that we can reach many more to share this message. <coughs> and now I'd like to turn this party over to my co-host, Diana. Caroline, I am so excited. Week one on Silent Mystics, we have a, a, a fantastic guest. I've known Aaron Robertson for what a good year. We've been working together on sessions and I'm amazed wow. and just intrigued by her background, by the skills and abilities that she has every time that we've connected. I've just been absolutely enthralled by this. And so I want to learn more about um, all about the animal communication and also some other mystical experiences that she's going to tell us about. So please, please welcome for our very first week, Erin Robertson to our show. Erin, what would you like to start with today? Would you like us to ask you some questions? Would that be the best way for you? Yeah, ask, ask away. Okay. Um, let's go back. Now we've talked a little bit and let's go back just a little bit. When we first started working, there was something that you, that I put out that drew you to me. And I would like for us to kind of start with that because it's, it's, it's our beginning place. So can you tell a little bit of what it was that, that made you feel like you needed to come and speak with me? Um, yeah. I had a good friend that passed away from alcoholism in 2018 and I've been on my spiritual journey since 2015 um, but nothing like this has ever happened before. Um, yeah, He passed away in August 2018. I used to work at a doggy daycare and he was an owner of a dog and he brought his dog in and his other dog had passed away and that's why he was there because his big entire Ridgeback Lincoln um, he was literally throwing himself out the window trying to find this other dog so he brought him into daycare and we just we just clicked that was just an instant click with this guy and Lincoln turned out to be good <laughs> and yeah he fit in well in the daycare and we me and Nick just grow a good friendship and then yeah a couple of I think it was a couple of months after that his mum committed suicide and then I smelt alcohol on his breath in the morning and yeah and just went downhill after that but the morning after he died I kept getting visions that day of him as spirit looking at his body in the bed looking at me <laughs> and didn't know what to do with that and then Diane you put up about Steve and how you saw him or felt him after he passed and I was like cool maybe I'm not going crazy <laughs> and yeah so that's how we connected I think that's really important for us that's part of this that's the whole idea of the show is um putting ourselves out there in a way that we we tell our story, we're sharing our story with other people because 
we go through these mystical experiences and we're like, what is wrong? You know, what, what is this? Is this for real? And especially after we lose someone like that, that we really care about, we want to think, of course, we want to think that they're still right there with us. Mm. Oops, what did Wendy can't find? It? Oh, but, but, sorry, but um, we want to think that they're still right there someplace. But then when we have those experiences where they're like, yeah, I'm right here. Then we're like, no, just, no, I don't believe that, you know? So, so this show is all about, you know, you, you've had some truly mystical experiences really since you were very, very small and, and you need a place, you need a place to share these things. So, um, Geraldine, what do you, you go ahead and take it for a second. Let me see if I can. Yeah. Um, uh, Here's the thing, and, and this is what I really want to touch upon with you, Erin, is you, your point was oftentimes, in fact, probably 100% of the time when people have a mystical experience like you had, they think they're crazy. This is how this, this is why this show was born so many are having these experiences that you had so many people in this time are awakening if you will and having this so we wanted to provide a platform for those of you who have felt like you were going crazy to be able to talk about that a little bit so that other people who are out there don't commit themselves into the institutions right away. You know? <laughs> so, you know, you said you felt like you were going crazy, but could you explain that for us just a little bit more? I mean, what was going through your head uh, at the time? And, you know, how, how did that come about? Uh, were you able to talk to anyone about it? That's the other thing. People don't feel as if they can talk to anyone about it. What did that feel like? I had absolutely no one to talk to, except for my cats. Um, yeah, it just it was just flashes in my head of him looking at his body in his bed. And then that lasted for about three days. And then it was like, he was saying, oh, I'm not going to wake up from this, am I? And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, you're not. Um, and then ever since then, he, it, he kind of realized that he was in spirit form now. And then he just kept coming to see me like he would in human form. Like he would just be like, oh, hey, how you going? What are you doing? And I'm like, but you're not there, <laughs> but I feel you. What is going on? All the while trying to act normal and human and not crazy all at the same time in a public place, which was weird. Now, see, that's fascinating because basically what you're saying is he didn't know he was dead at first. For the fir at first, no. Wow. Okay, that's kind of trippy, <laughs> you know, mm. and so how long did that take before he finally grasped? I think you said three, was it three days or so? I mean, was it uh, in linear time that he didn't know or? In my time, it was about three days. And was it you that convinced him mm. or was there help on the other side that helped him to kind of come to terms with that? Do you know or? I have no idea, Okay. but there was a time that he wasn't as strong, so he might have got help then, but yeah. Wow, wow. That's fascinating stuff. <laughs> mm. Anna? Yeah, it's interesting, and it goes through a transformation, truly. I mean, you know, I think that we all, when we start having these experiences with these souls, I know when Steve and I first, when I when he first passed, it was at a different level. There was a, a, an unhealthy, it wasn't that he was still earthbound, it was just that he had a lot of healing to do, and that when he was coming in, he was actually coming through a very unhealthy way for me, so that there was a cord there that I had to cut in order for us to be able to, um, to 
have a healthy connection to one another. And so that's part of what, when you came to me, that was something that we had to work on was creating some, a more healthy um, relationship. Not only is it important for you to know, Hey, you're not crazy. <laughs> you know, others of us are doing this and it feels good to be able to reach out and find those people. And then it's like, okay, what do I got to do here? Because this soul, he needs, he needs me. He needs my help. He's obviously still here. What, what, does he need from me and why is he here? I remember that was some of the questions that you asked me too, was, you know, what, yeah. what is going on here? And, and so, so it kind of evolved from there. We've been working together for a long time and I feel as if he and Steve are kind of like buds, you know, they're pals <laughs> and they work together a little bit, but further back, he came to you because you are very, very, um, very much a medium, very much a, um, you've got this connection to spirit. And you started that when you were very small. So if you want to tell us a little bit about that, I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Where did you um, us? When I was one year old, I can, I can remember this. And it apparently goes against all neuroscience, biology. Apparently you can't, shouldn't be able to remember when you're one year old. But I was on my grandma and granddad's farm and they were setting up a photo opportunity. My grandma, my granddad, and my dad was taking the photo of me petting a lamb. And granddad was holding the lamb. I was in grandma's lap. And I went to pet the lamb. And I could, I can still remember the lamb saying, like, talking like we are now. I want you to wait. I'm a bit anxious. I'm not comfortable right now. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay. And so one year old me waited. And then he was like, I think I'm all right now. You can pet me now. And then I started petting him. And I can, I can remember that. And to me, that's normal. <laughs> and all through my childhood, I, I've always been more connected to animals than humans. Um, I thought I was fine until I got to school <laughs> when I realized other people didn't do that. And I just could not understand human connection and why they would want to do the things that they did and talk with words and trying to get, do and have instead of sense, feel and be. Like, I I just didn't understand it. So I don't know if they didn't make friends with me or if I didn't try to make friends with them. I don't know which way it went, but I didn't have many if any friends at school mm -hmm. um and then that kind of turned into a bit of an alcohol issue when I was teenager 20 and then I got into volunteering after I got myself sorted out volunteering at a doggy daycare and that's when my gifts came back in the doggy daycare and still to this day I haven't done any training in dog training or anything like that all through the doggy daycare I just went on sensing feeling just being with the animals and it was it to, to this day it was a best time of my life <laughs> and I can I'm looking back at it now what I know now of dog stuff I was super confident in what I can do and what I I know I just felt the dogs and I just let it happen be in the moment there was a um, fair aggressive rock wheeler that I put into the pack <laughs> and there was a 
um, bull mastiff. She was my she was my friend. Oh, there was a bull mastiff cross pit bull. Her name was Cody, and she came in. Her dog friend had died as well, so she was very aggressive. She didn't know what was going on. It was a new place. Everything had changed. Everything in her life had changed, and she she wasn't aggressive. She was just scared and snappy. And I brought her in with a pack, the good bulletproof dogs, and they came up and sniffed her. She told them to go away. They went away, and that gave her a sense of safety. And I just sat with her on her first day for two hours, and just to, for her to know that I'm there. And I kept doing that day after day, and she became the most confident, <laughs> outgoing dog. And she ended up being my right-hand girl to bring in other mm -hmm. fearful dogs into the pack. And there was no training in that. I, I didn't need any dog training or methods. It was just being with her. And yeah, there's been other heaps of other experiences there where I just can't explain it. I can remember one time I was sitting, we had beds for the dogs in each room so they could sleep on them. And I can remember one time I was on the bed petting a dog and then I could sense something behind me not quite right. And so I turned around and there was, <laughs> there was one dog on the bed and there was another dog on the ground wanting to get up on the bed and they were having a bit of a standoff. And um, and I didn't see anything. I didn't hear, I didn't physically see anything. I didn't physically hear anything, but I sensed that like a disturbance in the force. I knew something wasn't right. And that gave me the five ten seconds I needed to be like get your own bed like <laughs> calm down and then yeah, there was another time I'm in New Zealand Christchurch New Zealand and we had a very large series of earthquakes in 7.1 in September 2010 and then we had the big 6.3 in February 2011 and in between then there was heaps of big aftershocks and so I was getting ready to go home from work from the doggy daycare one day and I had my special bond dog he was a brindle staffy called Josh and I was just about to walk out the door and his face flashed in my mind and I'm like, oh, I really want to go home, but he's my boy. So <laughs> I, I dropped my stuff and then I walked into his room that he was in. And as soon as we locked eyes, the big aftershock happened. It was like a five point something. And he just wanted me there. Wow. And I can't, I can't explain it. Yeah, it's not, you can't explain things like that, can you? It's just, it just uh, happened. It's all about trusting that you're feeling something that for, because I think that's the biggest problem with us with these mystical experiences. We want to, even the, the ego, not just other people telling us that we're not really doing it, but the ego says, no, that's not for real. It can't be. And so, so often, whether it be intuitive things that come to us or through these animals with you, I'm surprised. I'm just like, I'm really impressed with the fact that you heard that, that you're hearing these messages and that you acted on it. You know, you went that you heard that and you knew enough to say, no, this is for real for me. And I'm not going to deny it. I'm going to go with it. And you did. And, and it's such a good thing that you did. So that's a really powerful story. Now, I want to ask you just a couple of questions too, because it feels like it's really important. Um, 
when you were working in uh, these animal daycare centers, they had certain ways that they wanted to train dogs because, you know, they've always done it that way. Um, if you can't communicate with animals, then of course you're going to do it a certain way. The way that you've been trained is, is fine. And there's many, many people that are training dogs that way all over the planet. And that's fine. Except for someone like you who is actually able to communicate, you're actually hearing, you can't do things the same way everyone else is doing. Obviously it's like, you can't, how could uh. you just be put stuck into that box like everyone else because you've got a skill that they don't have and that's incredible to me so you know talk about that about your struggles of trying to fit in in that kind of a environment yeah it it was really tough um the i don't work in the doggy daycare anymore um i started in 2009 and then that doggy daycare got taken over by new management in 2016. And then I left in 2018. Um, yeah, I did absolutely no training, no dog training, worked with absolutely no dog training whatsoever from 2009 till 2016. And when the other daycare took over, it was just like a whole new world. Like they, disclaimer, <laughs> I do understand why dog training is there because people like me, normal people can't, do this like they've they've shut it down and I nearly shut myself down to try and fit in with the human world and it just didn't work and <clears throat> so dog training is yes to keep the dog safe in the human world if you can't talk to them telepathically I suppose mm -hmm. um but I feel dog training is just a stepping stone or a handle to grasp, grasp a deeper connection with your dog. It's not the be all and end all and stay there, come sit down, stay, do what I say because you're a two and a half year old child and I'm the parent and that's just it you have no say even if it is force free positive reinforcement no punishment whatsoever you're still roundabout way getting the dog to do what you want mm -hmm. and not giving the dog choice or letting it express itself this is my understanding anyway of what I've seen, of what the dog is. Yes, you can know everything about their physical and neurological states and everything, but that's only half of what a dog is. They've also got the mental, emotional and spiritual as well. And I see a connection with a dog as I'm learning from them as much as they're learning from me. They're not just there for me to tell them what to do. I, I, I don't see the point. You know, Aaron, I, I love what you just said that the dogs are a mental emotional and spiritual as well. Mm. I think that is the first time I've heard someone, at least out loud, maybe it's in a book or something somewhere, but say that. So to me, the fact that you're able to communicate with them in such a way that encompasses them fully, do you find that they 
communicate with you much easier because you actually get them? I mean, uh, this may sound like a silly question, but do they look at us humans sometimes and go, boy, are you stupid? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you just don't mm. get it. You don't get me. I mean, I know we're empathic in that. So um, do you find that they kind of go, wow, you actually are hearing. I've seen movies where people go, oh, you can see me. You can hear me. Do you get that response from the dogs or the animals ever? Um, or some as far as it is? Yeah. Um, I've noticed that I, and I, I don't know, in my world, if I, the dogs that I've interacted with in the doggy daycare that I've brought up, I suppose, or brought into the doggy daycare, they're more self-sufficient. Like they don't need me as much. And back in the olden days, they, I would give them an energetic box to work in and do their stuff. And I saw my role as just supervisor of what they wanted to do. I saw the doggy daycare as a safe place to be a dog. That sounds really stupid when you say it out loud, but. It doesn't. <laughs> uh -uh. Um, so my way of doing it was giving them an energetic box. I was always there to physically oversee what they were doing, mm -hmm. but they could like, for example, if a dog came up to another dog, that would give them the chance to interact with each other with, with their appeasement behaviors, like looking away saying, oh, I'm not ready for you to come in yet, or you're scaring me or play about, let's play. <coughs> if, another dog in that box wasn't listening to the other dog's appeasement behaviors, then I would step in because they need to learn that appease another dog's appeasement behaviors means you listen to that. But with the training style that I was forced to, well, not forced that was brought in it was they were a two and a half year old child I was the parent so I come like I was the be appeasement behavior the dog didn't have any chance to use its natural communication skills and I remember in one training that I saw <laughs> if a dog lays down when it sees another dog it means I'm no threat or I want to play and these two dogs had just finished their training and they do like a little play at the end and these two dogs both laid down one laid down the other laid down it was like okay cool we're both cool we want to play but the they took them apart because the human hadn't told them they could play yet, but they had already said that they were okay to play. And I just lost my mind. I was like, that's what you wanted in the first place. You said no to that. <laughs> yeah. I, they I don't. They can't see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. I, their that's reasoning was that, that their reasoning was that it's, the human needs to say when they can play. Mm. Okay. Which I don't think is right. See, I, the way that I see it with you, Aaron, is that you have such a respect. That's something that we haven't really learned to me with animals. We haven't really learned to respect the fact that they're seeing, mm. thinking, 
they're, you know, they are their own individuals and that, and that they can mm. make decisions for themselves and they can make good decisions for themselves. So in your form of training, were you to do this, which is why I wanted you to be on this show so that you could show people your abilities and really help us to understand, because you said stuff already that I was like, I never even thought about that. Yeah. I've seen like, like this dog that's visiting us when this mean cat comes at it, it melts into the floor. It's body language. It's like, I'm, I'm good. Like, <laughs> like I'm not a threat. <laughs> like you decide, it's like, no, I'm not going to threaten you. I'm, I'm in, invisible now. <laughs> you don't need to come yeah. kill me cat. So it's that is paying attention. And I think oftentimes when we're training dogs, we are just like, we're, we're going at it. Like I'm the boss and you're the servant or you're whatever. And you're here to please me. We're not paying attention to the actual body language of the pet. And so I'm so impressed with the fact that you can see that, that you're so in tune to these animals. And so were you to decide to create your own dog training, you would do things very differently in a respectful manner to those animals so that you would actually be reading them and knowing where they are. And like, we all have bad days. What if the dog's just having a bad day? What if the dog doesn't want to learn to sit and stay today? What if the dog is like, I'm having a bad day, man. You know, like, I just need some coffee. I need to go, you know, like, I'm going to go play. I'm going to go lay under the tree. I need to go ground my energy. And so here's Aaron coming along going, you know what? Your owner's coming in. Owner says, I want you to train this dog today. And you're going, I'm sorry, today. Your dog has got something going on. I'm not sure what it is, but they're not feeling good. And we need to be more sensitive to their needs. And I see you doing something in a way. I've always, I get goosebumps when I think about it, because I think that you've got a way of working with animals that you could do something completely different than a lot of people. You know, like we've seen a few, we've seen a few people that are like what I would call a whisperer that's actually communicating with the animal and they're training them in a way that's gentle and respectful and, and really feeling the heart of the animal. And I see that in you and it, it excites me to see that. Mm. So what do you think? Do you think it's, you might decide that it's time for you to just um, step out there and do things your way? What I've got in my head is actually train the human. Yeah. <laughs> the, the dog, the dog doesn't need any work. <clears throat> um, train the human to open up these telepathic senses again, because we closed them. We all had them, and just in this getting, doing, having world, we lost it. We need to fit in and look a certain way, be a certain way, act a certain way. If you say the wrong thing, you can't be different. Yeah. And neither. <coughs> My, what I see is me teaching humans that this is what life is. Like we are part of nature. We are nature we're the only ones that don't think that we are animals and we're the only ones that can't understand this language most of us and that's what the rest of nature trees plants insects animals that's what they understand and i've been going to equine assisted therapy and it just solidifies the same thing that we need to be more in tune with what nature is saying and because right. mm. look at the world now <laughs> yeah if, if we could if we could hear the world now we wouldn't have got to the space that we're at now if we could listen to the trees, the plants, the earth, animals, if we could hear what they were saying, we wouldn't be in this position. And, and that leads me to a question, Erin, um, is, you know, are there some general messages that they have a tendency to give you? Um, one of our viewers was talking about uh, uh, spirit and different ones like of course uh, Nick came to you after <coughs> he passed. of course didn't know that he had passed and um, so there can be a lot of messages and what uh, our friend John was saying is that they seldom does spirit sugarcoat and so 
uh, you know, we're talking about this is, you know, we're talking about animals, we're talking about spirit that has come to you as well. But when you're working with these animals, do you get at times this, um, uh, where they really want you to give their owners a message or, you know, owners, their family, their family to me, I don't own my animals, they're part of my family, but do you ever have that experience where they really use you as a conduit to express um, what their needs are from, from their, their uh, families, the pets? Mm. Most of the time, it's they just want more time being with them. And they want their owner to be more connected. And most of the time, it's their owner needs to look at something. Okay. The dog, it's, it's, yes, the dog's doing a behavior that the human thinks isn't quite right and needs to be changed or different or just, yeah. or just stop. Mm -hmm. But there's always a, a reason behind it. And that reason could be showing the human what the human needs to work on because dogs pick up on our energy and our, our emotional states mm -hmm. and that comes out as behavioral physical even medical problems mm -hmm. that so that's the main the main thing that i get when I work with people's pets and owners and stuff. Isn't that true so many times with us though, we're like around other people and that person is doing something and it's triggering us and we're like, why do these people keep coming into my life? I keep getting these people and they keep triggering me and making me so angry. And it's like, okay, stop. Why am I attracting these people into my world? Um, is there something that I'm doing that I need to learn from all of these people because truly we just will get our soul wants us to learn. So we're like, like little children and we will continue the same pattern. So when we go and get pets, oftentimes our pets will be that messenger to us also. And they'll remember that that animal has a, an advanced soul. Probably, I, I don't know if you'd agree with me on this, but I think oftentimes these animals are more advanced than we are as far, on a soul level. And so they're coming in, they've got the same, they've got soul contracts and agreements too. They're like, I gotta go in there and I gotta be that person's dog or that person's cat because they got something important to learn. And are we paying attention to those animals and listening, paying attention to those lessons or are we just trying to train them so that they can be like, you know, uh, this perfect little whatever and show it off to people. Look how great my dog is. You know, we need to slow down. Uh -huh. and what are they trying to show us? So thank you for saying that. That's really interesting. Yeah, and that's what my boy <laughs> that keeps coming on the screen has taught me he <laughs> he was a stray um two years ago and he just kept coming around the neighborhood and sleeping in our carport and then i started bringing out food to him and he just kept staying and this is in 2018 when my animal communication skills were completely shot from the other doggy daycare. And so I called him hello because of the mating call that it sounds like hello. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it just, it just stuck. And so he comes along and I have to learn animal communication again to get him more comfortable with me, try and get him in a cat carrier because his eye was closed over. He had a big abscess on his face. He had abscesses, scratches everywhere on him. And that took about nine months for me to be able to just pick him up and cuddle him. And then 
yeah, I just connected with him and let him know that I think he's the most handsomest boy in the world and that if P says no, I don't want you to do something to me, then I'll stop instantly. And that just was a base of trust for both of us. And we just kept working on that and just kept putting, nudging his boundaries a bit more and opening his window of tolerance for stuff. And yeah, and now he's a big mummy's boy and sleeps in my bed. And <laughs> so what was just, he trying to show you? Why did he? That's what I'm trying to connect to here. Does this cat mm. get into your world? Did you feel like he was trying to pull you back into your animal communication? Definitely back into my animal communication. And he is much like a dog where, like in the doggy daycare, you have to if you walk into a room, you've got to like connect and ground and just like zone out, be completely in the present moment. Now, if your world is hectic on the outside, you've got to leave that at the door mm -hmm. and walk into the room and just be calm and just in the moment. And that's what I needed to be with him as well when I walked <coughs> when I come home I couldn't be angry I couldn't be resentful or angry at anything that wasn't to do with him because he didn't understand he was like a dog in that way and I had to be 100 percent in control of my emotions or else it'll just flip them out and I've never had a cat that cared about that stuff before so and that's what I'm learning in the equine assisted therapy as well it's like knowing your physical sensations they have an emotional flavor and then goes on to what need do I need right now he was connecting me to the to my emotions, which I had not connected to very much up until that point. <laughs> Aaron, I have a question. Most of us, you know, some people are dog people, some people are cat people, some people are both. Do you notice or what difference do you notice between dogs and cats, horses, is there an emotional mm. difference? Because I know my cat's really independent and my dogs are very, oh, I want you, I want you, I want you, I want you. And a cat is a little different. So when you're interacting with both as you do, what are the differences that, or are there any? depends on the individual being okay. there are some dogs that are completely stoic and just like to sit up on the bed by themselves just do their thing and then there's <laughs> some dogs who will jump six foot fences to be with you and cuddle you and pin you to the bed and <laughs> bark in your face and just won't stop loving on you. Whereas boy is really, he loves his cuddles, but my other cat, it, she loves her cuddles, but on her terms and at certain times of the day. It just depends on in my opinion, depends on the individual animal and being and personality of the animal. I love that because mm -hmm. I think just like people, we like to stereotype people and stereotype, you know, who they are or, or even genders. Um, I think we do that with dogs and cats and horses and everything else. So 
I like that response because it shows us that just like people, they're all individual. They all have their good days. They have their bad days. They have their needs. They have their very distinct personality. And just like gender shouldn't matter, uh, an animal's gender shouldn't matter either. Her species shouldn't matter how we judge them, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I like yeah. it. Like it. Pit bulls are the most lovingest dogs I've come across. <laughs> they are just so friendly. And yeah, it, it most definitely is the wee ones you got to worry about. <laughs> Do you find that a lot? I mean, I know here in the States, if you have a pit bull or like a German Shepherd or a Doberman, your insurance rates are higher. Your home insurance is, is, is higher. And so people, poor, I feel so bad for pit bulls because they get such a bad rap. And do you find that, I mean, are there other breeds that you know of other than a pit bull that really get a bad rap, but don't deserve it? Um, Rottweilers are, uh one of the stuckiest breeds that I've found. <laughs> um, Dobermans, the Dobermans that we saw are I would say insecure. They're, they're not aggressive in the slightest either. And yeah, German Shepherds just need a lot of energy taken out of them <laughs> they're not no dog is aggressive but yeah the pit bulls bull breeds mastiff cross they were the a students time and time again <laughs> they just love playing and love cuddles and love being around socializing and yeah uh, we have a question um, from one of our audience members, Julie Kiss, and she talks about her daughter also uh, that is just like you, Erin, with all and all animals. She loves them and she communicates with them. She's asking, Erin, do you connect with animals on the other side as well, those that have passed over? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yep. I've got, I'm part of an online training animal communication group on Facebook and they put up photos of their dogs that are present or in spirit and yeah you just I just connect with the photo of the animal and it it just comes through and I still doubt myself because it's like it's just so to me, it's just so obvious what I get. I'm like, everyone will get that. Like, it's not anything special, but time and time again, like, the owners are blown away of what I pick up and what I know of the dog that I've never even met that's on the other side of the world that I got from a photo on the internet. <laughs> wow. Like, it's, it still blows my mind. But in a way, it feels normal too. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, yeah. if you were to give some people advice, what, I mean, is there anything that, um, I know there have been several people that we know here recently uh, in our, uh, in many of the groups we're in that have recently lost pets. Um, how, how do you know? How do you know if they're trying to communicate with you? Um, is there any guidance that you could give them? Um, just go with the senses. Sometimes they, I've had a cat come back in a dream. Um, yeah, my cat passed away and in the dream 
a cat was at the door just normally like I was going to open the door and let her in but she stayed there and looked at me directly in the eye and then stepped back and walked off and I was like what so as I come back in dreams and I've heard that if you have a cat and it used to rub up against you on your leg, if you feel pressure on your leg, or if you hear their collar when they're not there, or if you hear a faint barking, or yeah, just things that they used to do or if you just feel them around you, you just got to connect with your physical body to know if they're trying to get, connect with you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. I had a... It's a lot I, like, to me, it's a lot like... I'm sorry? No, go ahead. Go ahead. I feel like animal, this, this continuing relationship with these animals is like paying attention with me and Steve. It's like, I probably wouldn't know that he was still around me if I wasn't really holding space for him and allowing and, and watching and paying attention, really pay attention. If you really miss them, my understanding with pets is they step out of the body and they just continue on. Like they're just still a part of your life. They're still around you. So pay attention. Mm -hmm. You might see that they're close if you're really watching for the signs. I love that. Yeah. Love that. Um, and Etta says, I lost my last one eight years back. His name was Junior, a handsome white German Spitz. He comes in my dreams every night since he has gone. Oh, yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. That's very cool. Yeah. That's yeah. lucky. Yeah. And Julie I says, wow, way cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she liked your answer so thank you <laughs> very good thank you for the questions Julie so glad you guys found us we know <laughs> so we've got a we few kinks and today. we know we've got some kinks and it's okay this is only gonna yeah. get better in here it'll so get better, better. Yeah. we have so many with us and Jean Glorio says just like our kids our environment makes us would, would you agree with that Steph I, I, I get the feeling you'd agree with that a lot Aaron <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I've been learning about epigenetics as well. And it's the environment controls the cells, which can, which are us. We're just a whole bunch of cells and the environment turns off and on the cells that are in our body. So. Mm -hmm. Same yeah. Path, right? yeah. Yeah. We've done really well. I think we're almost to that point, Geraldine, where we're ready to. We're, I thank you so much, Aaron. I'm so glad that you joined us this week because it's been such interesting conversation. So I'm going to turn it over to Geraldine. Oh, and I want to thank you too, Aaron. I've I've learned a lot here today, and um, I I'm going to be reaching out to you because I have some more questions that I would like to ask you about some of my pets that have passed over and, and just, um, if you don't mind, that would be awesome. Uh, you're just, you are so delightful. You just really are. I'm just so pleased that you, you were our first. How nice. This was, this was yeah. lovely. absolutely lovely. And I would like to thank all of our viewers, you guys, thank you for the questions. Thank you for the comments. And uh, I hope that you will be with us again uh, next Monday, every Monday at 3.33. And who are we having next week, Diana? Next week is Sally and Tony De La Rosa. And that is gonna be so exciting because they're, they're opening a new healing center for one thing. Now we've all spent a lot of time with Sally. She is on, she's on the screen quite often. The show is all about bringing a voice to people who haven't had that platform too often. And Tony tends to be the one that's in the background. So we're hoping that this next week, Tony is gonna come forward a little bit. We're gonna share more conversation with her, kind of bring her voice out to the forefront. So I'm really excited about that show. Oh, I am too. It's gonna to be great. Cause I, I actually got to see some pictures recently you're going to have to watch this, Erin, if you can. Get up. Erin's in New Zealand, so 
And please, let's all thank Erin because she had to get up out of bed really, really early to be here with us today. Yep. And we're so grateful. Yes. But they had these pictures of all these ghosts that are in their healing center. So uh, it's going to be a great show. And speaking of great shows, Enlightened World Network and Enlightened EWN, Enlightened Living has so much programming. Oh my gosh. And you can find us on YouTube, Enlightened World Network, but go to and like Enlightened World Network or EWN, Enlightened Living, and like us and you'll be notified of all the programming that we have. It's amazing. And every day there is a daily guide that you can check out as to what that day's programming is on those two channels. So please join us again. Join us every day. There is something for everybody. And um, goodbye for now. Have a great week. And we'll see you next week at 3.33 on Monday. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much Bye. for joining us. Thanks. Bye, Erin. Bye. Bye.